Welcome one, welcome all. I am Bridger, and this is Cataclysm, A Second World War. This video is designed as an introduction to the game. It only covers a basic overview of the major systems in the game, and leaves out many rules and exceptions. After watching this video, you'll be ready to play the game with a knowledgeable player helping you along, or ready to dive into the rulebook with more context than if you went in blind. Let's begin. Cataclysm is a tabletop war game being released by GMT Games this month. If you have any questions while watching, check out the links in the description for the rulebook, the playbook, the GMT page, and the BoardGameGeek.com page. The game has many scenarios, but the main campaign game starts in 1933 and ends around 1945. This takes roughly 6 to 10 hours to play. Let's start by going over some basic information. The game is divided up into turns which each represent two years. Each turn itself is divided up into three phases. In the administrative phase, players collect resources and make plans on how to spend them. In the action phase, players build and upgrade units, conduct political and military operations, and suffer the many uncertainties of war. In the end phase, various bookkeeping actions are taken, and then a new turn begins. Cataclysm is a three-sided game that can be played by two to five players. The three sides are composed of the fascist powers, the democratic powers, and the communist power. Powers from other ideologies are called opposing powers. When your power goes to war with an opposing power, they are called enemy powers instead. This is an important distinction, so keep it in mind as we continue. In a three-player game, each player controls all powers from one side. In a four- or five-player game, the fascist and democratic powers can be split up amongst the players. Any players who share an ideology are acting as a team. In a two-player game, one player controls the fascists, while the other controls both the democratic and communist powers. The goal of the game is to gain control over territory and avoid losing your own home territory. As your power gains control of new areas on the map, you place down cubes of your power's color. Each cube is worth one victory point for the power it represents. If a power ever winds up with cubes on its home or colony areas which are not their own color, these count as negative victory points, indicating that said power has lost control of its home areas or colonies. A power's victory point total at any given time is equal to the total number of their own colored cubes on the board, minus the number of its occupied home or colony areas. Take control of other places, keep control of your home turf. Simple enough. Victory points are tracked both per power and per ideology. The victory point total for an ideology is the sum of the victory points of all the powers in that ideology. It is possible for a power to have negative victory points. If France falls as they did historically, for example, they will lose all cubes on the map and have their own home areas covered in German or neutral cubes. In this case, occupied France would continue to count as negative victory points for the democracies until they liberate her. Note that these victory points are not cumulative from turn to turn. Anytime a cube is added or removed from the map, the VP track should be updated to represent the current situation on the board. These victory point totals only matter at the end of the game as they determine which side wins. The game ends immediately under the following conditions. All powers from one ideology have surrendered, or one ideology has caused two other powers to surrender, or the war status is global war and no powers are currently at war. If none of the above take place, the game will end when it reaches the preset end trigger for the scenario being played. When the game ends, you check the victory point total for each ideology against the scenario victory conditions to determine the winner. Now we will move on to discussing components. There are two maps, one representing the European theater and one representing the Pacific theater. The maps are divided up into areas which come in three types, land, sea, and mixed. There are only six mixed areas on the map. The major difference between land and mixed areas is how supply is drawn through them. Powers can only trace supply through land areas if the land area is friendly. Mixed areas allow powers to trace through if they are friendly or neutral. This allows resources and supplies to pass through the Straits of Denmark, Turkey, or Indonesia unless those straits are controlled by enemy powers. There are quite a few different features scattered throughout the map, but here's a quick listing of what they are and what they do. Home areas are colored according to the power that controls them, and their names always have a colored box around them. 
Colony areas are also colored according to the power that originally controls them, but they have no box around the name and instead have a flag above the name. All other beige areas are called countries, and most of them start the game uncontrolled. If there is a colored cube on the country, it is controlled by the power associated with that color. All controlled areas are considered friendly to the controlling power. A power can also treat areas controlled by its allies as friendly, but only while at war. The textured look of some of the countries represents adverse terrain, which provides a bonus to the defender in combat and cancels the armor superiority effect in combat. The small boxes located in South Africa, the Urals, and California are called delay boxes. Any units which move into these areas are immediately placed into the delay box and prohibited from moving further during the current activation. The red lines here, here, and here represent impassable terrain. Areas separated by this red line are never considered to be adjacent for any reason, and as a result, units may never move across them. The red box with a fist represents the resistance value of the country. Diplomacy checks against countries suffer a penalty for each of these resistance icons. The red circle with an R indicates restricted terrain and represents areas of low infrastructure or particularly harsh weather and or terrain. Areas with this icon have a lower stacking limit and block lines of communication from passing through them. A line of communication is required in order to draw supplies during combat operations, collect resources, and more. Note that the Soviet Union gets to ignore all restricted terrain icons in their home areas on the European map. This is due to one of their special abilities called General Winter. The square markers in sea zones are called bases. The bases with only an airfield are called air bases and can provide capacity for air units only. The bases with an airfield icon and a port icon are called naval bases and provide capacity for both air and naval units. There are also three bases which are called the Special British Bases. These bases differ from the normal bases in that they are on land areas instead of sea areas and, if captured, they are removed from play instead of switching sides. These white boxes with black icons printed on the map are resources. They come in two flavors, lime green and cherry red. No, these two types are industrial resources and natural resources. They function the same in that both types provide one resource to their controlling power. Industrial resources have the additional benefit of providing free offensive markers upon mobilization and while belligerent. Industrial resources inside home territory also count as a production site for the original owner. Production sites provide supply and act as a location where units can be constructed. There are four pairs of connectors on the borders of each map. This allows travel between the east and west coasts of the United States, between the Urals and Siberia, between Persia and India, and between the Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean. That covers the items printed on the map. Now let's talk about the counters that get placed onto it. First, you'll notice a number of resource counters spread around the map at the start of various scenarios. These are called limited resources and can be collected by the controlling power during the administrative phase, just like the permanent resources printed on the map. Unlike the permanent resources, however, limited resources can only be collected once. After being collected, they are removed from the game. Each power will have the ability to construct units with which to fight the inevitable war. There are seven types of units. The standard land unit is the infantry army. The standard air unit is the tactical air force. And the standard naval unit is the surface fleet. During play, you will have the option of upgrading these units by flipping them over to their stronger sides. The tank army, strategic air force, and carrier fleet. The standard units only take one hit to eliminate, while the upgraded versions absorb one hit by flipping over to their standard side, and only the second hit will destroy them, sending them back to their owner's force pool. In order to upgrade these units, you will need to construct these upgrade markers. These markers never get placed on the map, but are rather built during the administrative phase and resolved during the action phase to flip units over to their stronger side. If you are seeking to defend captured territory, you may consider building a few fortress units. These are defense-only land units which cannot move normally once set up and provide a bonus to the defenders in combat. Relocating them takes them out of play for an indeterminate amount of time before they can be placed in a new area. You may only have one fortress per area. 
you will also see several minor armies scattered around the map at the start of most scenarios. These are located in countries which had a military large enough to be depicted at this game's scale. They represent their country's home defense forces, and as such, they will never move or retreat, merely defending their country to the death if it is invaded by an enemy. If you seek to blockade the oceans, a submarine pack is the naval unit of choice. These units cannot participate in offensive operations, but instead are granted an extended range and the ability to sneak past enemy naval units. This makes them uniquely qualified to send out and block lines of communication. Aside from land, air, and naval units, there is one additional unit category, and that is the logistics unit. Like fortress units, these units cannot move normally once placed, and instead must be removed from the map for some time in order to relocate them. Unlike fortress units, they have no direct impact on combat. Instead, they cancel all effects of restricted terrain. This allows you to better defend an area by improving the stacking limit back to normal, and allows you to trace supplies and collect resources through the area. Logistics units may also be placed in an area with a base, improving the capacity of that base for the appropriate unit types. Logistics units have no effect if placed in an area without a restricted icon or a base. Speaking of stacking limits, in this game they are called occupation limits. In any given land or mixed area, the occupation limit is 2 land, 2 air, and 2 naval units. Naval units, however, may only ever occupy coastal land areas. No, the Red Navy is not allowed to defend Moscow. In restricted areas, this limit is reduced from 2 to 1 land, air, and naval unit, unless, as mentioned earlier, there is a friendly logistics unit to cancel the restricted nature of the area. That logistics unit would restore the standard limit to two units per type. In sea areas, things are a little more complex. If your power is not belligerent, you can only occupy sea areas which contain a friendly base, and even then, you are limited due to the base type and the presence or absence of a logistics unit. Once at war, one naval unit and one strategic air force can occupy areas adjacent to any friendly coastal area or friendly base, provided the area in question doesn't contain an opposing non-enemy base. Tactical air forces cannot be sent out on patrol this way, though they may temporarily support combat occurring in areas adjacent to their position. While at war, your submarine packs also gain the ability to occupy sea areas away from friendly territory. Sub packs can occupy areas up to two spaces away from a friendly base or coastal area. Next, let's discuss the record display. Here, you will find a number of sections and boxes designed to keep track of various game data. First, let us examine the effectiveness and reserve display. The effectiveness rating of each power is located here and represents a power's willingness and ability to form and apply a coherent political policy. Anytime your power attempts a political action, you will need to pass an effectiveness check in order to proceed. Each power's effectiveness will change throughout the game due to various factors, and this display keeps track of the current effectiveness of each power. The effectiveness rating determines how many dice the power rolls during an effectiveness check. An effectiveness check is required for many situations in game, but is primarily used to determine if a political action succeeds or fails. A power with an effectiveness of 1 rolls a single die during effectiveness checks, a power with an effectiveness of 2 rolls 2 dice, and an effectiveness of 3 rolls 3 dice. Effectiveness checks are resolved by rolling the appropriate number of dice, with a result of 5 or better being considered a success. While we're talking about dice, reading dice in Cataclysm is fairly straightforward, and there are only a few general rules to remember. First, whenever you roll more than one die, count only the highest die rolled, and then add any dice roll modifiers. Second, if you roll more than one six, treat each additional six as a plus one to the result. Third, the minimum result on any die roll is one. Finally, you can never roll less than one die, if a power is about to roll one die and is required by an effect to lose another die, they take a minus one dice roll modifier instead. With these rules, we can generate this table, which denotes the likelihood of rolling at least one five or one six on the indicated number of dice. Comparing this with the starting effectiveness rating of the various powers, we can see that Germany has a significant advantage in effectiveness checks over France or Italy. In addition to political actions, an effectiveness check is also used to resolve a stability test. 
Stability tests are pass or fail tests and will be required whenever a power suffers some form of significant stress. This can happen for a variety of reasons, including losing control of a home territory, the collapse of an ally, internal political strife, or a military disaster. To resolve a stability test, simply roll an effectiveness check. Just like normal effectiveness checks, a result of five or better is a success. If the stability test is successful, there is no effect and play continues. If the stability test is failed, however, the power loses one level of stability. There is also a special stability test which must be checked once per turn for each power. It is called the home front stability test. Generally speaking, this special stability test gets harder to pass as the war drags on, and even has the possibility of dropping you down two levels of stability instead of one. Each power's current stability level is tracked on the record display. Here you can see there are four levels. There is no mechanical impact of being at steady, wavering, or unstable. However, if a power ever falls into collapse, the results can be disastrous, up to and including a full surrender and elimination of the power from the game. As each failed stability test drags you down the track towards collapse, a successful propaganda action will bring you back up one level towards steady. We'll come back to this when we discuss political actions. The political display keeps track of which powers are allied and which powers are at war. It's also where several tracking markers are placed throughout the game. The failed political action boxes keep track of each power's progress towards a given political action. If a power attempts a political action and fails the roll, they place a cube in the appropriate box. If that power's next political action is the same type as the box which has their cubes, they get a plus one to the check for each cube in the box. In this way, focusing on a single political action improves your odds the next time you try that action. A power can only have cubes in one of these boxes, however. If you ever succeed or switch to another political action, you lose all progress and all your cubes are removed. Next, let's look at the power status cards. There are seven of them, one for each power in the game. The available force pool is where all selected but unbuilt units are currently stored. The available markers box is where all offensive markers, flags, and special power markers are stored. The production holding box is a place to store all of these units and markers as you acquire them during the administrative phase. The commitment track denotes the current commitment level and its effects. The bottom two rows, conversion and home front, are identical across all power status cards. The top two rows, however, differ to represent the capabilities of these powers across the different stages of the war. We'll take a look at these from bottom to top. The home front row indicates the penalty applied to the home front stability tests for the current commitment level. As you dedicate more of your economy to war, you have more unrest at home, and this can affect your stability. The conversion row indicates how many builds your resources convert into, and how many military actions your offensives convert into. For example, at rearmament, the conversion ratio is 1 to 1. This means that one resource provides one build and one offensive provides one military action. At mobilization, each resource produces two builds and each offensive provides two military actions. The force pool row limits the total number of units and upgrade markers that the power is allowed to have in play. The United States, for example, adds six new units or upgrade markers to its force pool as it increases its commitment, culminating with a gigantic size 30 force pool while at total war. Italy, at the other end of the spectrum, adds only two units or upgrade markers every commitment level and tops out at a force pool size of 10. The other power's force pools are somewhere between these two extremes. Keep in mind, this force pool limit affects how many of these markers and units can be in the force pool or on the map. The rest of a power's units and markers must be kept aside out of play. The top row indicates how the power's effectiveness level changes over the course of the war. Germany, for example, starts with a very strong effectiveness rating, but eventually gets overstretched and loses effectiveness at total war. The US and UK both start out with average and gain effectiveness at mobilization. All other powers stay at one level for the duration of the game. This commitment level can only ever move to the right during the game. It can never travel back to the left. It is increased voluntarily through political action and is moved to exhaustion only as a result of losing too much stability and collapsing. 
there are two other basic concepts we need to discuss before jumping into the sequence of play. We briefly discussed lines of communication earlier. A line of communication must be traced in order to upgrade a unit, collect a resource, intervene in a civil war, or check for supplies during combat. Lines of communication are traced from a production site to the designated area. They may enter an unlimited number of areas provided each area is a friendly land area, a mixed area not controlled by an enemy power, or a sea area not containing enemy naval units or enemy strategic air units. Once at war, each sea area that's part of the trace must also be within two areas of a friendly naval base or coastal area. Also remember that a line of communication can be traced into, but not through, a restricted land area. Finally, we need to talk about interests and provocation. During the administrative phase, powers will earn flags, which they can then spend as a political action during the action phase. However, flags can also be earned as a result of certain game events, the most common of which is provocation. If your power is provoked by another power during the action phase, your power gains a flag to use as a political action later in that phase. A flag gained this way during the action phase is either placed into reserve or placed directly in the action cup. If a power is provoked and has no flags in its available markers box, then nothing happens. A power is provoked when an opposing power does any of the following. Declares war on it or its ally, intervenes in, declares an operation against, or gains control of an area where the power has interest, and forms or joins an alliance, or increases commitment, but only as indicated on the power status cards. Those first two categories will provoke any opposing power that qualifies, but the last provocation type is limited to the powers listed here. If a power forms an alliance or raises its commitment level, it is only a provocation against these powers. Japan, for example, is provoked whenever the US or USSR increase their commitment or join an alliance. Likewise, the US and USSR are both provoked when Japan increases its commitment or joins an alliance. The UK and France are not provoked by these actions as they are not listed on the Japanese status card. A power's interest limits where it can gain flags by provocation and where it may attempt diplomacy. A power has interest in the following areas. Every land or mixed area that it controls, every area which is adjacent to those areas it controls, this includes sea areas that are adjacent, every land or mixed area across a single sea area from its home or colony areas, every area where it has an aid marker in a civil war, every area where it owns a base, and every area where its ally has interests. This is a lot to unpack, so let's take a quick look at an example. Here we are at the start of the Days of Decision scenario. It's 1937, and all powers are at rearmament commitment. Germany uses a flag as a political action to attempt diplomacy with Benelux. Unfortunately, they roll poorly and fail. This is not a provocation against anyone because Germany did not actually gain control of the area. Later in the turn, the UK and France roll to form an alliance, and their role is a success. This is a provocation against all countries listed on both the UK and France power sheets. In this case, both countries provoke and are provoked by Germany and Italy, so both Germany and Italy gain one flag. Germany now uses its newly acquired flag to attempt to increase its commitment and fails the role. This is not a provocation. However, Germany gains a cube in the failed political action box for commitment. Later in the turn, Italy attempts to increase its commitment and succeeds. This is a provocation against all opposing powers on Italy's power status sheet. In this case, both the UK and France gain a flag. Italy also gains an offensive when it increased its commitment to mobilization and uses that offensive to invade Switzerland. Declaring an operation against Switzerland is a provocation against France because Switzerland is adjacent to France and is therefore in France's interest. It is also a provocation against the United Kingdom because the UK has interest everywhere that its ally has interests. 
France and the UK both gain a flag, and then Italy proceeds with their operation and is able to successfully capture Switzerland. This is a further provocation against the UK and France and generates an additional flag for each of them. Germany spends another flag and attempts to increase its commitment. This time, it gets a plus one to the roll thanks to the cube in the failed political action box. This attempt is a success, and Germany increases its commitment to mobilization. This also gives Germany some commitment offensives, and they use their first offensive as a surprise attack against France. A surprise attack counts as a declaration of war and a surprise attack, which means France and the UK gain two flags. Note that at this point, Germany is at war with France and the UK. These powers can no longer provoke each other. Instead, the main way of generating flags off an opponent when you are at war with them is conquering their home areas. Italy never formed an alliance with Germany, so they are not yet at war. Italy can still provoke and be provoked by the UK and France. Hopefully you can see the results of this system. The arms race can really heat up as both sides attempt to gain control of key countries, increase their commitment levels, and form alliances. As one side succeeds at these tasks, it generates flags for the other side so they can catch up. As they catch up, it generates more flags for the other side, and so on. It sounds like this might create a never-ending cycle, but due to various factors, this is not the case. The cycle eventually slows down, and the turn ends. Next turn, it will pick up all over again. Now that you have a solid grasp of the basic systems, let's take a look at how the game plays with an overview of the sequence of play. There are three phases to each turn, the administrative phase, the action phase, and the end phase. During the administrative phase, each power gains flags and then performs the production step one power at a time. Production involves collecting resources and deciding how to spend them. Each resource can be converted into one offensive marker or into a variable number of builds. The number of builds received is dependent on the current commitment level of the acting power, as listed on the conversion row on the commitment track. Builds are then spent to construct new units or upgrade markers. As each power gains flags, builds units, or converts resources into offensive markers, the appropriate counter is moved to the production holding box. There are, however, two exceptions to this rule. As fleets and fortresses are constructed, they are placed in the next turn of the turn track instead of the production holding box. On the following turn's administrative phase, they will be added to the production holding box. This represents the longer time required to construct fleets and fortresses at the scale of this game. After all powers have finished their production, each power gets to pick one counter from the production holding box to keep in reserve. This is placed on the reserve track of the record display. By placing a counter in reserve, a power can better control when that counter is resolved. If you really need to play a particular counter first, for example, you might place it in reserve to ensure it is executed quickly. After choosing which counters to reserve, all other counters in the production holding boxes of each power are collected and placed into the action cup. In the physical game, this is an actual opaque container like a coffee mug from which counters will be drawn at random during the action phase. In the Vassal module, it's a slot on the record display that performs the same randomization function. This is the final step of the administrative phase, and now we move on to the action phase. This is the meat of the game and where you'll be spending most of your time. The flow of play here is very simple. A counter is drawn from the action cup at random and resolved. This is repeated until certain conditions are met, at which point the action phase is over, and then we move on to the end phase. There is, of course, a little more to it than that. Just before a counter is to be drawn from the cup, any power can choose to interrupt and play the counter they have in reserve. If more than one power wish to interrupt at the same time, priority is granted to the power higher on the effectiveness display. In addition, no power may interrupt if a counter from their ideology was the last to be resolved. When a unit, upgrade, offensive, or flag is drawn, its controlling power must choose to resolve the counter, place it into reserve, or reject it. Rejecting a counter means that it's wasted and sent back to the force pool or the available marker's box. Each power may only have one counter in reserve, and if they place a second into reserve, the first must be rejected. What happens when a counter is resolved depends on the type of counter. To resolve a flag, the controlling power selects and attempts a political action. 
To resolve an offensive, the controlling power selects and performs one to three military actions depending on its current commitment level. To resolve a unit, the controlling power places it into a production site and then is allowed to deploy it. Deployment is similar in concept to a strategic move from other war games. It allows the unit to move a near-infinite distance using land, air, and naval movement, provided it never enters combat. To resolve an upgrade marker, the controlling power traces a line of communication to an appropriate unit and then flips that unit over to its stronger side. As these counters are resolved, they are placed back onto the status sheet of their controlling power in the appropriate box. This is with the obvious exception of units, which we just mentioned, are placed onto the map. In addition to the flags, offensives, units, and upgrade markers that are placed into the cup by the powers, there are three other types of markers that are always placed into the cup at the start of every turn. There are four crisis markers, which act as a random event generator. The first three crisis markers drawn from the cup are resolved the same way. Two dice are rolled, which selects a random event from one of the two crisis tables. One table is used during pre-war, and the other is used after a war has begun. These can have a variety of effects and represent events like a civil war breaking out, political infighting, economic problems, or civil unrest. After the third crisis marker has been pulled, the turn enters sudden death. At this point, pulling out the fourth crisis marker may end the turn. Once the fourth crisis marker is pulled, each power counts the counters left in the cup and determines if they have enough counters to continue based on the current commitment level. If any power has enough to continue, the fourth crisis marker is placed back in the cup and a new counter is pulled. This can and will result in some counters still in the action cup when the phase ends, meaning that they will need to wait until next turn for another chance to be resolved. As the war progresses, the number of counters being added to the cup increases, but the number of counters left unresolved at the end of the action phase will also increase. At the end of the first action phase of the campaign scenario, there will likely be 8 to 10 counters left unresolved. Later in the game, when most powers are at total war, there may well be 20 or more unresolved counters at the end of an action phase. In addition to the four crisis markers, there is also one home front marker for each power involved in the scenario. When the counter is pulled from the cup, the associated power must conduct a home front stability test. If you recall, this is a special version of a stability test that incurs a penalty based upon your current commitment level and can, in fact, result in two levels of stability being lost instead of one. Note also that even if your power's home front marker is at the bottom of the cup when the action phase ends, it will still be resolved in the end phase. There is also one Civil War Resolution marker placed into the cup each turn. When drawn, all Civil Wars are resolved, including the Chinese Civil War. This process could result in the Civil War continuing on to next turn, or ending in a variety of ways. If powers have provided aid to the winning faction, those powers may gain control of the country, or at least a bonus to diplomacy attempts against that newly united country. Like the home front markers, this counter is resolved in the end phase if it happened to be stuck in the cup when the action phase ends. Once the action phase is over, play continues to the end phase. This serves as a bookkeeping phase of sorts. If the Civil War resolution marker or any home front markers are left in the cup, they are resolved now. Next, all other markers in the cup and all markers on the reserve track are returned to the production holding box of their controlling power. These unused units, upgrade markers, flags, and offensives will then be available to the player on the following turn to be placed into reserve or back into the cup. This now ends the turn and play continues to the following turn. We have obviously glossed over quite a bit of the rules, so we're going to go into a bit more depth now of the more complicated aspects of the action phase, starting with flags and political actions. When a power resolves a flag, it chooses a political action and rolls an effectiveness check. If the check succeeds, the political action is implemented. If the check fails, a cube is placed in the appropriate failed political action box and play continues, with the flag being returned to the power's available box. Now let's take a look at the various political actions and what they do. The first option is forming or joining an alliance. Alliances can only be formed between powers of the same ideology. This means that France, United Kingdom, and the United States can all be allies, and it also means that Germany, Italy, and Japan can all be allies. 
the USSR unfortunately can never be part of an alliance because it is the only communist power. An alliance differs from all other political actions in a few key ways. All involved powers must each spend a flag at the same time. This means, for example, if the United Kingdom is resolving a British flag and wants to form an alliance with France, they can only do so if the French have a flag in reserve to spend on the attempt. Once all relevant flags have been spent, an effectiveness check is performed like a normal political action, but it must use the weakest effectiveness of the powers forming the alliance. In our example, if the United Kingdom and France want to form an alliance, the check would be made with France's measly one effectiveness, even if it was a British flag which was triggering the action. Alliances offer a number of significant benefits to the powers involved. First, allies share interests, which can generate additional flags for your ideology. Second, allies can treat each other's controlled bases and land areas as friendly once war breaks out. Third, allies may activate each other's units to perform joint military operations. Finally, when a power has war declared upon it, all its allies may immediately join the war without needing to expend a flag on political actions. The reverse is also true. If a power declares war, its allies can also join the war, but only if they are at mobilization or total war commitment. Speaking of war, next on the list of political actions is a declaration of war. Powers must be at mobilization or total war commitment to perform this action. If the effectiveness check is successful, a state of war now exists between the involved powers, and the declaring power immediately performs one free military operation against the target power. Remember also that a successful declaration of war is a provocation and immediately generates a flag for the defending powers. The fascist powers are allowed to declare war in a different way, called a surprise attack. Instead of using a flag, they can use a military action to perform an operation and declare a surprise attack. This generates a state of war between the involved powers and also incurs a penalty for the surprised power during the resulting combat. This surprise penalty can only be applied once to each ideology. Historically, this would be represented by the German invasion of the Soviet Union, Operation Barbarossa, and the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Next on the list is diplomacy. It allows you to gain control over one country. However, you are only allowed to attempt diplomacy if the country in question is in your interests and does not contain a power's land unit. The effectiveness role for diplomacy is more difficult for each resistance icon in the country and more difficult if an enemy controls it. Note that diplomacy is the only political action which does not have a box listed in the failed political action boxes track. Unlike all other political actions, diplomacy does not get easier if you focus on it multiple times. Next up, increasing commitment is something that we spoke about earlier. If the effectiveness check is passed, the power moves the commitment marker up the track on the power sheet and adds units and upgrade markers to their force pool. Note that commitment can only be increased once per turn and can never voluntarily be moved to exhaustion. Remember that commitment only ever moves to exhaustion if your power collapses while at mobilization or total war. If your power is at war, the effectiveness check to increase commitment is automatically successful. Next we have maneuvers. This one's real simple. If successful, this political action provides your power with one military action to perform immediately. Pressure is used to send flags to other powers. If the effectiveness check is successful, a power of your choice gains a flag. Lastly, propaganda is the political action which, if successful, allows you to increase your stability by one level. There are also a few power-specific political actions. You can learn about these in section 12 of the rulebook or on the ideology special rules cards. Now that we've covered political actions, it only makes sense that we talk about military actions and combat. Remember that military actions can come from two sources. As we just discussed, you can convert a flag into a single military action by attempting maneuvers. A power may also perform a variable number of military actions whenever an offensive marker is resolved. Remember that the current number of military actions you get from an offensive depends upon the current commitment level for your power. One military action for civilian or rearmament, two for mobilization or exhaustion, and three military actions per offensive for total war commitment. Each military action allows the acting power to perform one of the following functions. 
augmentation is used exclusively in conjunction with another military action called an operation. You would never choose to use an augmentation by itself. It provides a plus one bonus to combat score during the current operation. If your power plays an offensive while at mobilization, for instance, you would have two military actions to spend. One could be spent on an operation and the other on an augmentation for that operation, gaining an advantage in the resulting combat. If an offensive is played during total war, three military actions would be available, and it is thus possible to conduct operations with two augmentation actions for a plus two bonus in combat. Build actions allow the acting power to construct new units and upgrade markers in exactly the same method as the administrative phase. However, this action may only be chosen by a belligerent power. Units or upgrade markers may be constructed and placed in reserve, in the cup, or on the turn track in the case of fleets and fortresses. A deployment action allows every unit of the acting power to perform an unlimited number of non-combat moves. Remember that the logistics units and fortresses are prohibited from taking part in this deployment. Instead, they can be relocated by being picked up and placed into the action cup during a deployment action. When they are later pulled from the cup, they are then resolved normally and get their free deployment after being placed at a production site. The only major restrictions during deployment are the inability to perform attacks and the areas with a delay box. Recall that if a unit enters an area with a delay box, it must immediately be placed into the delay box and it is prohibited from moving further during the current activation. The last but critical rule in regards to deployment is this. Units which move during deployment are prohibited from performing an operation later during the same offensive. For example, Germany is at mobilization and has most of its army in newly conquered France. A German offensive is now pulled from the cup, and the German player chooses to play the first military action as a deployment action. He moves most of his army and air forces over to the Eastern Front. If the German player decides to spend his second military action on an operation invading the Ukraine, none of the units which deployed will be eligible to participate. They would need to wait until the next German offensive marker or successful maneuvers political action. The reverse is not true, however. Performing an operation does not prohibit units from moving in a subsequent deployment action. For example, Germany is at mobilization and has just finished conquering Poland with its first military action. Germany may now spend its second military action on deployment. In this case, all units would be eligible to move and could be relocated to the French border. They would now be in position for when the next German offensive marker is drawn from the cup. If you wish to send aid to a civil war country or a Chinese army, this is called an intervention military action. To perform this action, trace a line of communication to the civil war country or Chinese army, and then place one of your available offensive markers with the faction or army you wish to support. But why send aid to civil wars in the first place? Doing so grants your power interest in the area, which could provide valuable flags through provocation. In addition, if the faction you're supporting wins the civil war, there's a chance you gain control of the country, or failing that, you might get a bonus to diplomacy with that country. Aiding a Chinese army provides another benefit. A Chinese army with an aid marker rolls an extra die in combat while fighting against an invading power. This is one way for the U.S. to slow down Japanese aggression in China. Finally, the last military action is called operations. An operation is a military action which allows you to activate friendly units to move and attack a single target area. Friendly units in more than one area may be activated for the same operation by spending an additional military action for each area containing activated units beyond the first. There are three main operation types and a special subtype for each. The three main types are land operation, naval operation, and air operation. Regardless of the type, all operations follow the same operation sequence. First, the attacker declares the type of operation, the target area, and which units are being activated for the operation. At this stage, the attacking power can also choose to activate units belonging to an allied power, but the acting power must provide at least one of the activated units. Step 2 only applies under a special circumstance. Democratic powers may not conduct operations at all until they are at war. 
Once at war, they may freely conduct operations against enemy-controlled areas, bases, and units, just like the communist and fascist powers. However, if a democratic power wishes to conduct an operation against a neutral country, they must pass an effectiveness check during step two of the operation sequence. If this check fails, the operation is canceled and the military action is forfeit. Step 3. The attacker declares if they are augmenting the attack with additional military actions to gain the bonus in combat. Step 4. Powers provoked by the operation gain flags. Step 5. Check supply. All units involved in the combat attempt to trace a line of communication. Any units that cannot trace this line of communication receive a limited supply marker, which applies a minus one penalty to the combat result of the affected side. Step 6. Move the activated units into the target area. Step 7. Resolve combat, which itself has four steps. Step 7A. Commit support units. Depending upon the type of combat, friendly air forces and friendly fleets in adjacent areas may be able to move into the target area to provide support. Remember, you must still obey occupation limits. Air units may support any type of combat. Fleets may only support naval combat. Note that in order to support, the air forces or fleets must be located in an area with an airfield or port, respectively. All land and mixed areas contain an airfield. All coastal areas contain a port. All bases contain an airfield, and all naval bases contain a port. Step 7b, if both sides have air units in the battle, a round of air combat is fought. Step 7c, now resolve the land or naval combat if applicable. Step 7D, resolve aftermath. This refers to things like conquering a land area, capturing a base, gaining flags, conducting stability tests, adjusting victory points, etc. Now, let's examine the three main operation types. Land operations target a neutral or enemy land area, and only adjacent land units are eligible to participate. Though remember that eligible adjacent air units can provide support in Step 7A. If the only land units left in the area after combat belong to the attacker, then the attacker conquers the area. If there are any land defenders left, the attacker must retreat. Naval operations target an area containing an enemy fleet or strategic air force. Note that this can be used to attack land, sea, or mixed areas. The goal of this operation type is not conquest, but merely to inflict casualties on the enemy or force him to retreat from the area. The attack on Pearl Harbor or the Battle of Midway are historical examples of a naval operation. Air operations target an area containing at least one enemy air unit. Like naval operations, this operation type has only one objective, to destroy enemy air units. The Battle of Britain is an historical example of an air operation. Now let's talk about the special type of operations. The special land operation is called an amphibious invasion operation. There are several requirements and special rules cases associated with amphibious invasion operations which are not present in standard land operations. First, an amphibious invasion requires the simultaneous expenditure of two military actions instead of one. Second, it can never be performed as a surprise attack. Third, the invasion path must be traced through one or two contiguous sea areas, each of which must contain a friendly fleet. If the invasion path is traced through two sea areas, the invasion is being conducted at extended range and the attacker receives a minus one penalty to the resulting combat rolls. Next, the special subtype of operation for naval units is called a base capture operation. This type of operation must target a sea area containing an enemy base, and at least one attacking fleet must participate. If, after combat, the attacking side is the only one with naval units still present in the area, the base is captured and flips to the attacker's control. The Battle of Iwo Jima is a historical example of a base capture operation. Note that no land units are involved in a base capture operation. It is assumed that there are marine contingents included in the fleets which do the actual capturing. The special subtype of air operation is called strategic bombing and must target an area containing a resource. If successful, this operation allows the attacking force to damage the resource in the target area. Permanent resources are only damaged for one turn, while limited resources are removed from the game. Now let's go back and cover what actually happens in Step 7b and Step 7c of the operation sequence. Step 7b is air combat. If the operation type is an air operation, or a strategic bombing operation, one round of air combat is fought, and that is it. 
If the operation type is land or naval, an air combat round is only fought if both sides have air forces supporting the battle. For land and naval operation types, step 7C is when the main land or naval combat is resolved. Resolving combat uses the same procedure for all three combat types, though some of the modifiers can be different within them. The procedure is as follows. First, we determine the number of dice being rolled. By default, in any given combat, each side will be rolling two dice. This can be modified in a few ways. If one side doesn't have any units matching the combat type, they roll one die instead. This one die represents a notional defensive or offensive force that is too small to be represented at this game's scale. For example, if the USSR declares a land operation in the Baltic states, the defending Baltic forces will start out rolling only one die because there is no land army present to defend. If instead, the USSR declares a land operation against Poland, the Poles will start out rolling two dice due to the presence of the minor army unit. After determining starting dice numbers, they can be modified further. In land or naval combat, if one side has more air units, it will roll an additional die. If the defending force is a civil war country or an army, it expends aid and rolls an extra die. Armor superiority only applies in land combat where one side has more tank army units. The opposing side would roll one fewer die. Remember that armor superiority is cancelled and does not affect the combat in areas of adverse terrain. Carrier superiority applies only in naval combat when one side has more carrier units than the other. It also forces the opposing side to roll one fewer die. Next, we calculate bonuses and penalties applied to each side's roll. Remember the rules for dice in Cataclysm. Once dice are rolled, count only the highest number and then add bonuses or penalties to that number. Here you can see a list of bonuses and penalties. These should be self-explanatory. Now we roll dice and determine the outcome. After applying all bonuses and penalties, the side with the higher combat score wins combat and the other side must suffer losses. The number of losses suffered by the losing side is equal to the winner's score divided by the loser's score, rounding down. A result of 6 to 2, therefore, would incur 3 losses for the side which rolled a 2. A result of 5 to 2 would be only 2 losses, and a result of 4 to 1 would be 4 losses. If scores are tied, neither side wins, and each side must suffer 1 loss. Losses must be applied to units matching the type of combat. Only air units can suffer losses in air combat, land units in land combat, and naval units in naval combat. Each loss will flip over one upgraded unit to its standard side or eliminate one standard unit. At this point, the losing side may reduce losses by one if they choose to retreat, but may not choose this option if the scores were tied or if all their units will still be eliminated after retreating. In land and naval combat, there is also the possibility of a triumph or disaster. If the losses suffered by the losing side exceed the number of steps present in the combat, this is a triumph for the victor and a disaster for the loser. The triumphant power immediately gains a flag and the power suffering a disaster must conduct a stability test. Note that if the losing side of a land combat did not have a land unit in the battle, there is no triumph or disaster. Similarly, a losing side in a naval combat that did not have a fleet at the start of the battle would also not suffer a triumph or disaster. Whew, that was quite a lot. Let's take a look at an example to see how these operation and combat rules work in practice. This is an example that occurred in a recent game. It was the 1939-40 turn, and I was playing as the fascist powers. After conquering France, Germany is ready to invade the Soviet Union. I'm short of forces because I'm saving my limited resources for total war, when they'd be providing me with the most builds and military actions. Lucky for me, the USSR was worried about a Japanese invasion, and had staged three infantry armies in the Pacific Theater. This means the USSR is also short of units on our mutual border. The Soviet Union is sitting at wavering stability thanks to a failed home front stability test in the previous turn. Since I'm ahead on victory points, I can win if I force the Soviets to surrender. Remember that if all powers from an ideology have surrendered, the game immediately ends and the victory points determine the winner. This isn't as easy as it sounds, however. The USSR has a special ability called No Retreat. This allows them to roll an extra die on all propaganda and normal stability tests, but not home front stability tests. This makes it harder to force a surrender, but the USSR is only two steps away from collapse. It can still work. 
I decide on a bold strategy. My tank army would attempt to bypass the line of fortifications, attacking through the Baltic states and the forests around Leningrad. If that works, a final assault against Moscow. This would force the Soviets to endure three or four stability tests, one for losing Leningrad, two for losing Moscow, and, if I was lucky, one for a military disaster. Critically, they have no air units at all covering the northern section of the front. This guarantees air superiority for my forces during any combats which take place in the north. The first thing I did was increase my commitment to total war. I then waited for a German offensive to pop out of the cup, hoping it would arrive before a Soviet flag was pulled. A flag would allow them to perform a propaganda action and increase their stability, ruining my plans. And the next pull from the cup was... A German offensive, and we're off to the races. It's springtime for Hitler and Germany. Germany has three military actions to use now, and for the first, I declared an operation against the Baltic states. For this land operation, I activated the tank army in Poland. This does not require a declaration of war against the Soviet Union, even though they control the Baltic states, because the country is not garrisoned. If the Soviets had a land unit in the Baltic states, I would not be allowed to attack it without also going to war with them. I decide not to add any augmentation to this operation, as I was already going to have armor and air superiority. Unfortunately, this is a provocation against the USSR because they have interest in the Baltic states. Therefore, the Soviets gain a flag. Next, we check supply. Everything is fine, so we move the units into the Baltic states and move through the combat steps. I commit my air units from Poland in support. There's no advantage to bringing extra air units, as the Baltic states does not have any air force with which to contest. The USSR cannot support, as we are not at war, and even if we were, they do not have any air units adjacent to the combat. Since the only air forces present are from one side, we do not resolve air combat and instead move on to step 7C, land combat. The Baltic states will be rolling one die with a DRM of minus one. This is due to two factors. First, they have no land units involved in the land combat, which reduces their dice from two to one. Second, I have armor superiority, which also reduces their dice by one. Recall that final rule of dice in Cataclysm, however. If a side is to roll one die and is required to lose another die, it takes a minus one to the result instead. Thus, the Baltic state defenders roll one die and subtract one from the result. Germany rolls two dice plus one extra die for air superiority for a total of three dice. The final tally is three dice for the attacker and one die minus one for the defender. This roll heavily favors the attacker, but it's still possible that something could go horribly wrong. And lucky for Germany, everything goes according to plan. The result is 5 to 2, which would require the defender to suffer two losses. However, there are no defending land forces in the battle. If the loser cannot absorb all losses required, this would normally cause a triumph for the winner and a disaster for the loser. However, remember that triumphs and disasters only occur if the losing side eliminates at least one army or fleet. The attacker is the only side with land units left after the land combat, therefore the attacker now conquers the area. Conquest has a short series of steps to perform as part of the aftermath of combat. In this case, the effects are Germany adds a cube to the Baltic states, Germany gains a victory point, also increasing the fascist total by one, German units may now regroup, and the USSR gains a flag due to Germans gaining control of an area in the Soviet Union's interest. Regrouping is an effect that allows the winning side to shuffle their units around after combat. In this case, land and air units are allowed to move into or out of the target area. This could allow me to move all forces back to Poland or move some of the forces from Poland into the Baltic states. However, I don't want to leave Poland defenseless and my next plan is to attack Leningrad, so I decide not to regroup any units. For my next military action, I declare a surprise attack against Leningrad with the same tank army. This resolves in much the same way as the attack on the Baltic states, but with a few new elements. First, I declare that I'm not using any augmentations. This is a risky move, but I've decided to commit fully to this bold stroke, and it requires that I save my last military action for an assault on Moscow. Next, the Soviets would gain not one, but two flags. This is a result of the surprise attack, which grants two flags instead of the one provided by a simple declaration of war. However, the Soviet Union has no more flags to gain. All are either in reserve or in the cup. They gain nothing instead. 
We now set cubes into the political display to indicate that the USSR and Germany are now at war. Neither side has a problem with supply, so the attacking tank army now moves into Leningrad. German air forces move into support, and we move on to land combat. This time, the Germans will roll three dice, and the USSR will roll two dice minus one. The Germans gain one die thanks to air superiority. There is no armor superiority applied, however, because armor superiority never applies in adverse terrain. The USSR will therefore roll two dice with a plus one modifier for defending an adverse terrain, a minus one modifier due to being surprised, and a minus one modifier due to their current posture. This is a net of two dice with a minus one dice roll modifier. That last modifier is from a special track on the Soviet power sheet which forces the Soviets to choose between being good at politics, military, or diplomacy. Whichever option you choose, the other two get penalties. Since they are currently sitting on political purges, this results in a minus one to all their combat results. The USSR is going to want to switch to military purges as soon as possible to get rid of this modifier. With that decided, the dice are now rolled and success! The Germans' luck holds. Not only do they win the combat, but the defenders now have to suffer two losses, yet they have only one step of land units in the area. The Soviets cannot choose to retreat and absorb a loss, since this would still result in their entire force being destroyed. This is a triumph for the Germans and a disaster for the Soviets. Germany gains a flag, and the Soviets suffer a stability test. Thanks to their no-retreat ability, they will roll three dice for this test instead of their normal two. Lucky for the Russians, they manage to pass the test with a five, and there is no loss of stability. We now move through the aftermath again. This time, the effects are a German cube is added to Leningrad, the Germans and fascists gain one victory point, the Germans are allowed to regroup, Germany gains a flag for conquest of an enemy home area, and the USSR suffers a stability test for losing control of a home area. The Soviets are not quite as lucky on this stability test. The result is a three, not enough to pass, and their stability is reduced from wavering to unstable. The Germans choose not to regroup. With the second military action complete, the Germans declare their third military action as a land operation against Moscow with the German tank army. Things shake out much the same, with the German air unit moving into support. Germany will be rolling three dice again, thanks to their air superiority. The Soviets will be rolling one die minus two. This is due to a lack of a land army, the German tank superiority, and the political purges modifier. Notice that there is no surprise modifier in this combat. The surprise penalty only applies to the operation which launched the surprise attack. Also note that supply is checked before the German tank army moves into the target area. This means they would be able to successfully trace the line of communications required, because you can always trace into a restricted area, just not through a restricted area. Things are looking grim for the Russians. If the Germans can succeed in capturing Moscow, they not only get to place two cubes on it because it's a capital, but it also forces the defender to suffer two stability tests. Here it is, the big moment, the dice are rolled, and... Mein Gott! The Germans rolled triple snake eyes! The odds of this roll are 1 in 216, or about half a percent. All is not lost, however. If the Soviets also score a 1, the result would be a tie. The Germans would merely flip over their tank army, and they'd still conquer the area. Thanks to the minus 2 penalty on the Soviet roll, there's actually a 50% chance of this happening. Great! Googly moogly! Look at that! The Soviets roll a 5, reduced to a 3, which results in 3 to 1 loss for the Germans. The Germans are required to suffer 3 losses, but have only 2 land steps in the battle. This is a triumph for the Soviets and a disaster for the Germans. As this was the final military action, the German offensive is now over, and the Soviet player breathes a sigh of relief. This example actually happened in my recent game. After getting lucky in Benelux, France, Poland, the Baltic States, and Leningrad, the Germans seemed like they were unstoppable. Germany took risk after risk and won every time. At the Battle of Moscow, however, their luck finally ran out. If the Germans had captured Moscow and the USSR failed one of their stability tests, there would be a 50% chance that they would surrender and the game would end, and a 50% chance that they become exhausted instead, but keep fighting. This result proves that anything can happen in a war, even if the odds are only a fraction of a percent. 
After all, there were plenty of events in the historical course of the war which were unexpected to the participants at the time. The Germans forcing a French surrender in 30 days, the British evacuation at Dunkirk, the massive defeat of the Japanese at Midway. Each of these events occurred due to a mixture of factors, including brilliant commanders, incompetent decisions, bad or good intelligence, and most importantly, a healthy dose of luck. All of these are captured within this combat system, which provides for mostly expected outcomes, but every once in a while, a small defensive force will win a heroic victory. There are quite a few ways to interpret what happened in my example. Perhaps the Germans were hit with bad weather, which severely slowed their advance and reduced the value of their air power. Perhaps the Soviet partisans successfully sabotaged a vital supply line. Perhaps a brilliant Soviet commander had spent months planning for just this scenario and exacted all of his contingency plans to outfight the Germans despite their advantages. Remember, we're viewing all of this at a high level. We are not in direct control of the armies. The local commander's performance is abstracted into the dice rolls. Sometimes even a great commander will be wrong, and sometimes a hero will emerge to stop an otherwise unstoppable foe. For these reasons and more, I thoroughly enjoy Cataclysm, A Second World War, and I hope you will too. If you have any questions after this overview, there are links to the rulebook and the playbook in the description. There's also a link to the Board Game Geek entry for Cataclysm. There's a forum there with a special section just for rules questions. So you can look through there and see if somebody's asked your question and then post it if nobody else has. Cataclysm, A Second World War is available on the GMT website and through all normal board game distribution channels.